Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your Elite Tax Update webinar. My name is Vicky, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately one hour, with a few questions at the end. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on the webinar's control panel. Today, we will we'll be re reviewing the changes to tax 2016 and other impacts of the 2016 federal budget. We will also be discussing the changes to the ELS lodgement system and how much longer this will be available based on the information from the ATO. Our presenter today is David Parasol. David is the Managing Director of CT Solutions Australia. David has had extensive experience in providing taxation and business services to a range of clients and is currently involved in taxation and accounting training programs, including both vocational and both postgraduate courses. He is an experienced accounting trainer and mentor and has been an accredited Reckon software trainer for over 15 years. Without further ado, I'll just hand you over to David. Thank you, Victoria, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, as we do go through uh, today's session, as, as Victoria mentioned, we will certainly keep you informed of some of the changes with the software uh, and also make you aware of some other things to help you with your tax 2016 season. Just before we do get into the session today, I need to run through a very quick disclaimer with you that says Reckon Limited and the presenters who are independent parties do not provide legal taxation, financial or investment advice. Please be aware that all information presented and in the Reckon Elite Tax Update is for general information only. It is not professional advice and is not intended to cover your specific circumstances. You should satisfy yourself of the requirements of relevant laws and regulations and seek your own advice from your professional advisor for your specific circumstances before relying or acting on information presented in the Reckon Elite Tax Update. Reckon Limited and its related bodies corporate and the presenters to the extent permitted by the law have no legal liability to you in respect of the information presented. So now that we've got that disclaimer out of the way, welcome to today's update and we're going to get, take you through a, a couple of I guess important aspects and changes to the Elite software. Number one being the federal budget update, uh, looking at some software updates and tax changes. We'll talk briefly about Reckon Elite Hosted because there has been some inquiries about that, look at some software compliance issues and then finish off with some questions at the end. Now starting off with some federal budget updates, now we're trying to look at some of the things that were certainly proposed in the recent federal budget, uh, but now that we've had an election, we're going to be interesting to see how many of these actually do get through the Senate. But let's look at some of the important ones that will probably have effect on clients that we are dealing with. And the first one being changes to the small business entity threshold, which has increased from $2 million to $10 million. And what that meant was the $20,000 immediate asset write-off, which did start over 12 months ago now, uh, is now applicable to small business entities that do turn over up to $10 million. The company tax rate will be cut to 27.5% for all SBEs as well, and there is a decrease in the tax rate for all companies proposed to 25% by 26.27. Now, there were a range of other measures that were noted uh, in the budget, including the expansion of the SBE concessions. But what's important to take into account is what is relevant and what's not, because the simplified depreciation rules obviously is one of the big changes that does apply for assets that do cost less than that $20,000 threshold. Uh, and then it does revert back to $1,000 post 30 June 2017. Uh, the $10 million turnover businesses now have access to the simplified trading stock rules, so that helps avoid year-end stock takes for movements of less than $5,000. Uh, the simplified method of paying PYG instalments calculated by the ATO, which removes the risk of under or overestimating PYG instalments and the results and penalties. There was also some expansion of access to the SBE concessions in terms of the option to account for GST on a cash basis and paying GST instalments as calculated by the ATO. And other concessions like the FBT concessions that will be applicable from the 1st of April 2017 
and the immediate deductibility of professional expenses. Now one really important point to note is the threshold changes are not meant to affect eligibility for the small business concessions, which still remains at that $2 million, or satisfying the maximum net asset value test. Now, the other thing that did change, obviously not everyone trades their business through a company, so unincorporated businesses with an annual turnover of less than $5 million do receive an increase in the discount to 8%. Uh, up to a maximum value of $1,000. So after the initial increase, the discount will be increased in phases to a final rate of 16% in 2026-27. And what the government tells us is that based on their projections that over 3 million businesses will gain access to either the lower tax rate or the higher discount in 2016-17. Now, a range of other issues for consideration include things like the Tax Avoidance Task Force and red tape reductions for business and improved integrity for the consolidation regime. You've also got to remember the changes to the individual tax brackets, which have now increased to $87,000 from the $80,000 and some of the superannuation tax reforms. Now, everyone does know we, we have now had an election result, but at the end of the day, what happens now? Because we have seen, I guess, almost a hung parliament, and we've probably got what we can term a bit of a hostile Senate. So what is going to happen with some of those announcements that were proposed? Uh, let's hope there is a little bit of common sense that does eventuate with the parliament in, in the current sitting, and hopefully some of the announcements that are designed to stimulate the economy and assist small business in particular uh, do successfully pass through the Senate and we can move on and better advise our clients. So let's have a look at some software issues. Now, when it comes to the latest version of, of Reckon Elite, one of the key things to note is now that 2016 tax has been released, the first thing that you need to do is update your practice management. So at the moment, version 1.12.29.0 is required to run the tax 2016 modules. And one of the first questions that will be asked if you're having to call technical support for any reasons, they will always ask you what version of practice management you are running. So it's always important just to make sure that you are running the latest iteration of the software so that when you go to help and support uh, and when you click on the about button, that tells you straight away what version that you are running. So it is important up front to just make sure that you have the latest versions installed. It's also important that this time of the year that you do check for updates to tax forms because once they're released by the ATO, then Reckon Elite will release them. And if any changes to forms do eventuate as a result of some things passing through the Senate, then again, you'll need to go in and update those particular uh, modules, or if there's a new form that comes out and is activated by the ATO, again, download those updates. Now, hopefully most of you are now pretty comfortable with the new interface. Uh, it's designed, I guess, a more icon-based view. Uh, obviously, like with anything new, it does take time to get used to, but it is important that as part of your understanding of the new interface, some people just forgot where to find certain things. Now, one of the things that a lot of people just want a little bit more guidance on is the setup manager itself. And when you do go in to the software and you do click on to uh, the help area, so with help and support, you'll find there's a range of things that can always assist. Now, if you've got any staff in your offices or you yourself are a new user to the software, one of the things that will certainly help initially is clicking on the help and support tab and understanding simple things like a functionality locator. 
So some people just forget where to find things and you can click on there and it's got changes in the navigation. And it just gives you a little bit of guidance on simple things like the ribbon menu, uh, which is basically looking at the top of the screen. And you can see there, there's a little ribbon there. You can move it, you can collapse it, um, and you can push it down to here below these icons. So you can change the way your screen looks and feels. Now, as part of, again, finding things in the software, a lot of what we're going to go through today, if you click on the What's New button, uh, it will tell you a little bit about some of the changes here in practice management. But when you click on the What's New button, when you are in an individual tax return, for example. Now, one thing just to be aware of today is we do go through some of the demonstration. I'm using dummy clients, so they've got some test tax file numbers. So you'll see these messages that do crop up on my screen as we go through today. Now, when you do click in and view the jobs, when you go into tax 2016, and you open up Mary's return, uh, when you do go in and want some help, the first thing that you'll see is the what's new. And this is telling us what's new in tax 2016 with a focus on individual taxpayers. So when you go into a company return or a partnership return, you'll find that you get information there that will help you with the various returns that you are processing. And when you go to the practice setup, uh, and we talked about looking at some of the uh, issues with the software. You'll find that when it comes to your updates, um, obviously you might have your system set up to automatically check for updates. And just to highlight, there is a form for superannuation funds that is a new product that's been out for a, a couple of weeks, but again, we haven't downloaded it yet. So if you tick on that box, you can select it and download the return form for super funds. So again, it's always important this time of year just to quickly check through that sort of information and just make sure that again, you have also applied any program updates. Now, a common question that gets asked is when practice management does get updated, it's important that you download it and it may ask you to exit out of the software first before doing the update. So you download it, exit out, and then go in and install the software. And remember that if you've ever got any issues downloading the updates from directly within the software, go to the Recon Elite website and you can download things directly from there. So just a couple of things to be aware of up front with the navigator. Obviously, when you're starting out, you're going in to the home page. And one of the things a lot of people forget about is some of the shortcut icons at the top here and what they actually do for your clients. Now, one of the things that you can do is obviously attach client notes to various clients that you have. When you click on new, one of the things that you can do, let's say there's a note for Mary, and uh, Mary is uh, coming into the office next week. So we'll put a little note in that she's coming in next week, uh, and we make a little note to uh, check for any RBA debts. Okay, so that ultimately, uh, as part of going through and preparing yourself for the meeting, uh, we can populate that note through. We can also assign a category, and that category might be a follow-up category. Uh, again, we can print it out or we hit OK and it will leave a little note on the file. But one of the things that some people prefer rather than using the notes is when you do go to your clients, when we do pick out Mary and click into her, one of the things that you'll see on the screen is the client alert area. Now, one of the key things to remember about client alerts is when you click on edit info, you can change the importance of an alert. And let's say that this alert has gone from red to orange because we've got a bit of an extension of time and it no longer has to be lodged by the 31st of October. We have an extension to the 31st of March. So it's not as urgent as some of our other clients which maybe didn't get an extension. 
Now, one of the other areas that people often are not aware of uh, is this little miscellaneous area here. And one of the things you can do if you've got clients or maybe you've got family or friends that you do their returns in your practice and you want to restrict access to the return, you can put a password on to the client. Uh, but the other thing you can do as well is you have a little area called user tags. And what user tags allow you to do is you can use sort of three characters there. You can see I've got REN, which stands for rent, because Mary has a rental property, and SUP because Mary has an interest in superannuation. You might also put in the word deduction because Mary wants to know a little bit more about deductions that she can claim. And what you can then do is you can use these user tags to help draft letters uh, or documents to clients based on some of those preferences. So it is a way to leverage off your database and allow you to produce some um, letters or documents that need to go to clients. We'll go through that with the tax returns later on. Now the other thing to note, which again a lot of people are not aware of, if for example you're maintaining a list of contacts that you also want to mail merge letters to, you can set up in Elite your contacts and that might be for law firms or for investment advisors or insurance brokers or people that complement the work that you do in your practice. So you might set up a contact database within the Reckon Elite and all you need to do when you're setting up a particular client, uh, obviously you can go back to set up a client, uh, click on new and you can set it up as an individual, even though it's not setting up the tax return side of things. And what you then do is you change the status to being a contact. So rather than setting up the tax returns, you can just set up some general contact information for advisors or consultants or others that you might use within your practice. Now, you've got some other little areas within here. Uh, again, for any new users that are using Elite, you might find that when you click on the uh, glossary, uh, you can get some guidance on certain things within the software. You can use the task manager, which allows you to set tasks for others in the practice. And let's say I'm currently logged in as the administrator, but I want to go in here and I want to assign some work for Mary uh, to someone else in the office. And we said that Mary's coming in next week. Uh, the status is active. I can assign that to Harry, uh, who is going to be responsible for that. Uh, and you can make a little note to say, get RBA information organized. And you can set a reminder so that a reminder comes up tomorrow morning to get that particular task done. So when you save that, again, you can make sure that you do save that. So if I hit close without saving that, it gives me that warning, hit yes, and now a task has been assigned to Harry. So at the moment, I can only see the administrator tasks, but when I click on view all tasks, I can now see all of the tasks assigned in the office. So the various staff in the office that have tasks to do, we can now see a list of those things. The other thing that people, again, tend to forget about is the calculator is not just your basic calculator, but some of the simple tools that you've got in there. You've got a date and age calculator. So let's say that you've got a client who has a child that was born on the uh, 1st of April 1987, uh, today at the 30th of June 2016. We want to know how many uh, days uh, that is, if it's looking at the acquisition of an asset, uh, but also we might just want to know the date of birth and how old uh, that taxpayer is. Uh, and basically, again, measuring that as of the 30th of June, that client's obviously well above 18 years old. But let's say that it was now 01, uh, oops, I should say 2001. Uh, again, looking at the number of days that an asset's been acquired. Well, down the bottom here, looking at how old a taxpayer is, and now we know that this taxpayer is under 18 years old. The tax side of things, again, you've got clients, it's, we've just hit a, a new tax year, 
Uh, client rings up, oh, I've just had a pay rise to $80,000. Uh, there's no budget repair levy because it's under the threshold. Uh, we include Medicare levy, but there's no surcharge. And work out that on an annual basis, the annual tax should be just over $18,700. Uh, and that will calculate their net amount. You can change that, obviously, to show their weekly or fortnightly pay because the taxpayer just wants to know what's going to be in their pocket. You've got a Division 240 calculator. So again, client rings up, wants to borrow $100,000. Uh, it commences on the 1st of July 2016. Uh, oops, there is, again, it always gives you that warning when you uh, don't put in the right uh, date. The residual here is zero. Uh, it's paid at the start of the period. Uh, let's just say they've got an interest rate of 7%. Uh, there are in total 60 instalments, so it's five years, and there are 12 instalments per annum. You can click on Calculate, and that very quickly calculates the interest for the year. And when you print it out, you've got some details around that. Uh, if we were to look at, uh, oops, I made a mistake there, uh, look at the interest rate. Uh, which has been, uh, I guess, grayed out because we wanted to calculate. Uh, you are able to then calculate the payment, which works out at just under $2,000 a month. So again, if you wanted to do a quick analysis of that, there's a Division 240 calculator. And then finally, there's a very simple Division A calculator. So if a client borrowed $50,000 in the 2015 year, with seven years remaining, it just does a very quick minimum loan repayment calculation. As you can see, there's a little bit of space, so hopefully we can get a few more items added to this calculator at some point. So that's another useful tool to help you. Uh, obviously, there are other things like document management, uh, an appointment diary. If you've got time cost loaded, uh, you might have access to the time clock. And what some people do, they run the clock while they're working on a client, stop it and then can process that into a timesheet. Reckon Docs, for anyone not aware, is basically looking at ASIC and corporate documentation. So you can set up new companies, trusts, and self-managed super funds very quickly. Um, and you can set up an account and start to process returns and as we should say set up companies uh, as you go. And if you do have any clients that use Reckon accounts, you've got a shortcut link to that as well. So as part of going through the practice management, there's a whole lot of tools that you might find useful uh, as part of going through uh, and working with the software a little bit more. So just to highlight those things to you up front, uh, obviously, one of the things as your practice grows, uh, you're able to look at the users and restrict access to what they can and can't do within your firm uh, and the ability then to add more responsibility as they become more experienced or uh, are given more authority in your practice. So coming back to what we were talking about, uh, from a setup manager point of view, when you're first setting up Elite is to remember that uh, there will be a database set up uh, for you. Uh, it's called Reckon Elite backslash data underscore SQL, uh, which looks at the settings. Uh, you can then locate uh, the database on a individual computer or if it's networked. But we always do say sometimes it's better to get IT people involved if you're not overly experienced with IT environments just so they can make sure that you know, it's set up appropriately for your practice. So that's just some of the fundamentals in practice management. Let's now have a look at the tax changes. And these are things that some of the items you will certainly need to deal with in 2016. There'll be a few things that will move through quickly because I'm assuming that most people may not be affected by the changes. But let's start by talking about the declaration requirements. Now, as a result of SBR, requirements for declarations have required some changes. And what you'll find now is there's now a field to capture both the tax agent's acceptance of the return and the date. So you can see what's circled in red. Uh, taxpayers sign the form and the date the tax agent signed the form. 
uh, that needs to be completed with your returns. Now with FBT, note that for 2017 there has been a rate change. Uh, so we now have 49% for the current FBT year. Uh, the type 1 and type 2 benefit rates were updated accordingly. Uh, you've got the PBI threshold and the car parking threshold change as well. And the other thing, just as a reminder, if you are doing FBT returns, just watch the date of acquisition of cars. Remember now that any car acquired since the 1st of April 2014 does use the flat 20% rate, but just be careful of transitional purchases that may have been before that date. Now when it comes to the return itself, you'll see now that a Type 1 benefit is calculated at 2.1463 and the type 2 benefit is 1.9608. And note that what is shown on the screen goes back now a few years with the old rates in Elite. Now some of the major changes for 2016 that you do need to be aware of. Number one is the net medical expenses tax offset phase out. You'll find it's very specific now where that particular offset does apply. So most clients will no longer qualify for that. The simplification to car expense deductions, changes to general identifiers to streamline and improve the CGT treatment of earnout agreements. Uh, some changes to the exploration development incentive, uh, closing down some of the loopholes in the offshore banking unit regime, and then a couple of TOFA label changes. Now, anything, as we mentioned, that we do see today, if you want to go back and check it for yourself, you can go in and click on the help button within the return you're looking at. So we've selected here the company tax return. Uh, you can go in there, click on the what's new button, which is the first button you will see uh, when you click on the help and it will give you a listing of changes for the various tax returns. We mentioned the first one being the net medical expenses tax offset phase out. Uh, from the 1st of July 2015, only taxpayers with net medical expenses relating to disability aids, attendant care or aged care will be eligible to claim the net medical expenses tax offset. And also remember that the income testing of that offset will remain. The other thing that is probably a big change is the removal of the one third and 12% methods of claims for car expenses and noting that the cents per kilometre rate is now fixed at 66%, engine size no longer matters when it comes to your car expense deductions. So one thing that you'll note when you go into the schedule, it looks a bit different. You can see now with methods, you can only use the logbook or the set rate per business kilometre when you're doing the calculation. And you need to put in the details and it will still give you the option uh, to choose which method. You can see you've now got a ticket. Under the old elite, once a taxpayer had travelled more than the required 5,000 kilometres of business travel, the system would automatically select the best of the four methods. Now another point to recognise is some changes to gender identifiers. Again, this is an extension of something that came in last year, but it's because of legal protections against discrimination on the grounds of identity and intersex status. Information about people's sex or gender should only be collected where there is a legitimate need for that information. So for example, if a service or benefit that's going to be provided to the individual is directly related to their sex or gender or such information is necessary to perform their specific function or for broader government statistical or administrative purposes. So what you'll see now when you go into 2016 tax is historically it used to have sex, male or female. When you now go in to the returns and when we jump in to uh, Mary's 2016 return, you'll see that on the first page of the return, oops, 
that that little area is now gone. So that's been removed from the return uh, because it's no longer a requirement. Now with super contributions, uh, just remembering the government's super co-contribution threshold uh, for 2016 is $50,454. It was 49488 so a slight increase there, but the low income super contribution remains unchanged at $37,000. Now the temporary budget repair levy does still remain. Uh, obviously this was introduced in 2014-15 tax year and so it does still continue to apply and it does apply to all individuals whose income exceeds 180000 and it's calculated as 2% of the excess over that amount. Remember that the levy does apply to residents and non-residents as well as any minor taxpayers that may hit that threshold. So when it comes to the return for those that have clients above that threshold, remember that you've got the Medicare levy surcharge if it's applicable and then underneath it's got the temporary budget repair levy as well. Now a couple of other changes, there was some streamlining and improvements to the CGT treatment of earnout agreements. So very simply what you'll see there is uh, again just a little adjustment to the worksheet if you have any clients affected by that. There were changes to the exploration development incentive and once again if you don't have clients that are involved in small mineral exploration. Uh, that don't have any taxable income, they are provided with some exploration credits which is paid as a refundable tax offset to any Australian resident shareholders. Unless they're a corporate tax entity in which case they receive franking credits. And this is for Greenfields Mineral Exploration Expenditure. So if you've got clients who are small mineral exploration companies, be aware of this. But on the other side of the fence, when it comes to clients that are receiving uh, a distribution from a mineral exploration company, there's now been a new field added into partnership trust fund and individual tax returns. So what you'll now see, for example, at item 13 uh, with a partnership and trust distribution, you will see a share of exploration credits box sitting in the middle of that schedule and if they do receive a distribution from an EDI then they get a figure that goes into that column and you can see there that what you do is you enter the taxpayer's share of the exploration credits from each partnership or trust engaging in that activity. Now again when it comes to completion of the return it is a refundable tax offset so what then happens is that if it's an E, it's an exploration credit refundable offset which is being claimed. So that's just the, the places that you, you need to complete if you've got a taxpayer in recipient or in receipt of this particular offset. Again what happens if a taxpayer does receive the offset, it will once again appear on the estimate for the year as an exploration credit. In different structures, uh, you've got again looking at the income side of things uh, and again if it's a trust distribution in the statement of distribution there's been an additional field added to that section at item 54 uh, in a trust return. The next point to note is closing the loopholes in offshore banking uh, unit regime. Again, this is probably not something that's applicable to most. Uh, it is a modification to the international dealing schedule, uh, so at item 41, and there are some fields that are required, but again, it's probably under very limited circumstances because the taxpayer needs to be an offshore banking unit or the head company of a consolidated group that included an offshore banking unit. 
Again, with TOFA, again, if you don't have any clients that are impacted by this, there were some fields and labels that have now been made redundant. So, for example, TOFA balancing adjustments in item eight uh, in an entity return are no longer required. Again, same with thin cap and foreign dividends if you don't have any clients impacted by this. And remember that the thin cap rules do not kick in till over $2 million of interest has been paid. Uh, note that Section 23AJ for John has been repealed uh, and as a result there's been some changes to this particular field, again in the international dealing schedule. So this change is going to affect company, partnership, trust and fund tax returns and you can see there questions like 24D have now been removed. The other change, the abolishment to the first home saver accounts uh, in item 16, you'll find that the word or the acronym FHSA has been removed uh, because it's no longer relevant. For those that have clients that are primary producers within an individual return, you have uh, some information that can go in under your land care expenses. So very simply, if a deduction is being claimed, you enter the taxpayer's share of the total of any eligible expenditure on land care operations and any eligible expenditure on facilities for conserving or conveying water that relate to primary production income or a loss from that partnership. So what you'll find in an individual return, you'll see a box under the reconciliation items where land care operations and deduction for decline in value of a water facility fencing asset and a fodder storage asset. So that's been adjusted in the individual. In the company return, you'll see the same thing in the reconciliation area. Uh, and again, when it comes to the reconciliation, if you wanted to put in more details, behind that there is a schedule that allows you to complete a worksheet for any specific deductions claim for land care operations and water conservation or conveying expenses. So again, in looking at the details if you wanted to complete the schedule. It doesn't go to the ATO, but it's something that you might want to fill out for your own completeness purposes. In a trust return, again, you'll see in the reconciliation items, similar feel to the previous company and individual return. And again, when it comes to capital allowances in a trust return at item 48 under capital allowances, 48L is where you can put in the relevant information. Now a couple of other things we mentioned before with the federal budget update, the small business income tax offset for unincorporated entities. Uh, this one is a non-refundable tax offset that does go into the small business income tax offset information. Uh, you'll see there the share of net small business income and you can populate it in again in item 54 uh, and make a note of the share that's going to the relevant beneficiary. In the partner beneficiary returns, you'll see that in the distribution section, again, there is a new box that has share of net small business income and a potential for an offset applicable to an individual taxpayer or a partner in the partnership. Another thing that has changed is related to the small business startup expenses. Now note that again, federal budget said that expenses can be fully deductible in the year in which the expenditure is incurred. If the expenditure relates to a small business that is proposed to be carried on and is either incurred in obtaining advice or services relating to the proposed structure or the proposed operation of the business. Uh, it's a payment to an Australian government agency of a fee, tax or charged incurred in relation to setting up the business or establishing its operating structure. So think of the black hole expenditure rules where if you paid for the incorporation costs of a new company, uh, you would write that off or be able to write that off over a five year period. These expenses can now be fully deductible in the year in which they are incurred. 
So what that does in terms of the schedule at item 15 is you'll see there that there's now a box that allows you to choose immediate deduction yes or no and if not there is also the 20% claim under black hole expense rules so if there's a $20,000 amount incurred uh, for formation costs that can be claimed up front uh, or uh, using the old rules, if it was incurred a few years ago, it would be $20,000 multiplied by the 20% and there would be a $4,000 deduction in the current year. The SBE immediate write-off and pool changes, as we mentioned earlier, the federal budget has enhanced those accelerated depreciation rules for any SBE turning over up to $10 million to immediately deduct each asset that costs less than $20,000 and that will continue until June 2017. Remember that that replaces the old rules of the $1,000 for those entities in the two to $10 million bracket uh, and the balance of the small business pool can also be immediately deducted if the balance is less than $20,000 at the end of an income year, again up until the 30th of June 2017. With self-managed super funds, this is just a reminder of something that did kick in last year, but for those that are preparing these uh, super funds, you'll find that there are two bank accounts that can be included because the EFT details for tax refunds can be different to the main super account. So you can populate two sets of EFT details and down the bottom of the screen you'll see that in an electronic service address alias has been added to the EFT section of the return. So now that we've gone through some of the updates, let's now go in to the software and have a look at some of the data processing issues for 2016. And as we mentioned up front, when you are looking for assistance with Elite, there's a number of different places where you can find help within the software. Firstly, you've got the question mark icon on the top right hand side of the screen and that gives you general help about the module you're in. Or you've got a question mark help button in the bottom left corner of the screen which will provide help on the screen that you're actually in. So when you go in to Elite, what we were saying by that is the one down the bottom here will give you help on the personal detail screen of an individual and the help button up the top here will provide details on the tax return or individual tax return itself. So just to be aware of that as something that's always useful. And then finally what we're going to have a look now in the software is some of the things that, again, it's a reminder for some, but it might also be new to those who are new users of the software. So today we're going to be working with Mary Jones. And we're going to have a look at a couple of things to shortcut the return approach. Uh, in addition, in 2016, she has a TSL loan, a balance of 30,000, and she's got a help debt as well of 23,000 at the 1st of June 2016. So let's now go in and have a look at Mary's return and some details. Now, given that we are only in the first couple of weeks of the new tax year, uh, note that portals are probably not finalised as yet and certainly if you've got clients that are in receipt of dividend income, of managed fund income, you normally find that those particular schedules uh, in terms of the portal export are not finalised till potentially the end of August. So just be aware of that and also be aware that portal printouts and uh, your upload is not guaranteed to be correct. Uh, if you've got taxpayers that do have lots of share or investment holdings, you'll normally find that what comes out of the portal is not always right. So just to be aware of that up front. Now we're going to start just by looking at 
the 2015 return so we can demonstrate a uh, import from the uh, portal. Now very simply, one of the things to always consider when it comes to your clients is to look at the batch data and use some of these little shortcuts. Now as we said, the OTO prefill is probably not ready yet, so let's take a 2015 prefill. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to create an import by selecting an appropriate file. Now, very simply, to do an import, uh, obviously the first thing you do is click on ATO Prefill. Uh, you potentially uh, have to click on, or you certainly need to click on the little button down there. But you need to read and familiarize yourself with the details. And like we just mentioned, it says the ATO do not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any client data supplied by the portal. It's your responsibility to check with the taxpayer that any data is correct and complete. So again, if you know the history of shareholding that clients have, make sure that appropriate dividends and any other earnings has been captured. So what you do is, you once you tick this box, you need to select the file. Uh, what we do is we go in and select Mary, uh, we hit open, and we click on next. Now what it then does is it processes through the pre-fill details so that you can review the information. And note that for 2016, the process is almost identical in a sense that you go to the portal, you select the relevant taxpayer, you download the file, okay, and you'll find that that particular file is an XML file. Uh, so .xml is the file extension. You then go in and when you're processing it, the first thing you do is you can review the data. Uh, some people like to print it out physically first so they can match it off. Others just like to view it on the screen. But when you go into this schedule, you'll find there are a range of income details. Uh, you've got all the portal information relevant to Mary's situation. But even though we've got that information, we still need to make sure that it is appropriate and that some information has transferred to the appropriate areas of the return. So let's just say that I'm quite happy to do this and click on the import button. And it gives you a little warning before you do that. Are you sure you want to import relevant data from this file into the return? And we say yes. And then there's a whole lot of other pre-fill warnings. This is what has been imported. This is what has not been imported. Uh, and maybe in this case, we're dealing with a dummy pre-fill report. But in some cases, it's just important to pay attention to the warnings and just make sure that data has transferred appropriately. You'll also see that in my example, I've got a range of uh, private health details imported. We know that's not right, um, and so we need to go in and fix that up. So once you're comfortable with it, we can go in and we can start to review the information that has come through. And we mention that when it comes to private health insurance, we know we had a whole lot of duplicates. Uh, so you can just go in here and delete it. Uh, obviously, when you do your real pre-fill uploads, you'll not have the same number of these coming through. Uh, but again, if the client has changed private health policies during the year, you need to check it and make sure that the dates mentioned in the pre-fill are appropriate. So as part of going through that, you can then go through the pre-fill, add any other details, and then finalize the return. So that's just something just to highlight the approach from the uh, pre-fills. I'm going to now come out of there and I'm going to now go into Mary's 2016 return. Now Mary's return in 2016, always a good idea when you first come into the return. Click on the V errors and you can have a look and see anything that you can quickly get rid of. Um, again, if you're not certain of what a V error is, just click on the item itself. Click on the V edit help and it will tell you what is missing or what may be incorrect. Now one of the things that often happens is you forget about the income test labels and you need to make sure that this is one of those fields 
that you need to populate a zero in to eliminate that particular V error. So going through this, you need to put in the zeros. Once I've entered in the zeros and go back to my V errors, you'll see that that error has now gone. The other thing to be careful of, especially when you've rolled over a client from the prior period, is to click on the V8004 and check your rolled over data. And when you double click there, it takes you to the relevant section. You'll see here there's just some information that's probably incorrect because it just said triple T with no income items. Click on next and come out of there. And then it's a matter of just checking because that error is now gone. But if that was not the only rollover error, you might need to go into there a few times. And you'll see a little button up the top here that you can click into to correct any of those rollover issues. Now checking a few things like postal address, uh, you'll see there that you've got the current postal address coming through practice management, uh, the home address, and just noting that no, the address hasn't changed since last year. So as part of going through, you can see that we're slowly eliminating some of the potential errors. Now there's a couple of things up front when you first go into a return. Always a good idea to start with your mandatories. Uh, by going through the mandatories, you can quickly highlight things like, yes, there was a CGT event, no, the client doesn't have foreign assets or an investment in a CFC, uh, there's no direct or indirect transfer of property to a non-resident trust estate, and Mary is not an SBE. So I can quickly fill out that and that will again get rid of another V error for you. So we've only got a few left, but rather than go through the rest of them, let's have a look at some of the key components of a return to help you complete those for 2016. Now if you're doing a return for a client right now and they've given you some managed fund documentation, just be careful because there may be some more income that may come through the final distribution, which often the notices are issued in August. So just be careful of that if you've got clients with managed funds. But let's just say that in this example, we have an investment in the Westfield Group. Uh, as part of going through, uh, we can put in some information. And what it's always a good idea to do when you're going through this particular schedule is just to make sure that you're filling in the correct field. So you'll see that in a minute when we get towards the end, it's going to come up with some warnings because I haven't filled in everything appropriately. Let's just say there's $100 of modified passive income and we have some capital gains. We got $3,000 worth of capital gains. And you can see there because it's a discount gain, it's got $3,000 here and the discount amount is $1,500. Now you click on next and you'll see that I've been able to come out of there. But if I had filled in some of the income on this side here and I hadn't necessarily filled in the situation, you'll find that what often causes an error or not allowing you to come out is that you need to fill in one of the drop down boxes. So just to be aware of that and in terms of the approach, uh, just make sure that you do select the relevant, that if it's a non-resident trust or someone under a legal disability or a non-resident beneficiary that that's appropriately tagged. Sometimes it's also about choosing the appropriate type of non-primary production code and for example, let's say it's a cash management unit trust. Hit on next and you'll see now there, right, we have an error because we've filled in something that says non-primary production income must be entered if the NPP code exists. So come back out of there and we can remove that uh, information. So just hit the, uh, oops, sometimes it doesn't let you do it, uh, hit the backspace key to get rid of it 
and then we can escape out of the schedule. So just be careful of that. If you are getting errors or warnings, usually it's just because a particular field has not been entered. And if you're not sure what things mean, once again, click on the help down the bottom and that will give you help for the managed fund worksheet. So we come out of there and we go now to the next batch data, which is for POG summary. Now, let's just say that Mary is an accountant that works in a bank and uh, we click on a new worksheet and she has been employed by the ABC Bank and she has received a gross salary of $120,000 with tax withheld of $37,800. She hasn't received any lump sum, she still works there, uh, but they have actually provided her with a car because let's say she's a mobile lender and she has reportable fringe benefits of $12,000. She's also salary packaged your some super contributions. Now, remember before we put in a zero in total reportable fringe benefits amounts, the system knows that now it's gonna overwrite that figure with $12,000 because we now have some information coming through the POIG summary. She's also salary package $10,000 in super. That will also come across into that schedule. Now, Mary is a very giving person and as part of her workplace giving, she has donated $1,000 to the Red Cross and she has also donated some money to the Salvation Army of another $1,000. She's also received an allowance. Uh, let's say that she does travel a bit with work and she has received a travel allowance of $300. So we've populated all of this in the one schedule. And the reason for doing it here is that populates a range of different fields in the client's tax return. So rather than having to go into a range of income areas, this has populated that for us. So that when we now go to her return and click on salary and wages, you'll see the message that this row has been transferred from a POIG summary worksheet and cannot be edited here. You need to go into the POIG summary worksheet instead. Allowances have come through, the travel allowance and other things such as the donations which have come through from her POIG summary. So again, it's a great way to save a bit of time when you're working through a return. Now, Mary's also got a number of bank accounts and let's just say that she has a bank account with NAB that has earned about $12,500 of interest. There's been no TFN withholding, but she's only a 50% holder of this account. So what you can see now, when you change that percentage to 100, that the sharing side of the return becomes active. What you can then do is go down one line and you can make a note and you can link that to, let's say, her auntie, Wilma Flintstone, who is the other holder of that bank account. It's a 50-50 account between Mary and her auntie, Wilma, and they each receive 50% of the income. Same with dividends, Mary has a few dividends and she also owns NAB shares, but she got about $250,000 in dividends because she's owned it for a long time. There was an inheritance from her father and she received a, a huge dividend during the year. And in this case, it's 100% hers. But again, she also has some dividends that she owns with her cousin. And what we can do, just put in the dividends there, it's a $10,000 dividend, but she's only entitled to 50% of that. Again, the shared area opens up, and when I go in, and Wilma again is the other 50% holder, and that will allocate in to Wilma's return. Now you'll see there that when I click on NAB, the sharing section disappears. When I go down there, it appears again. So it is a line by line link, so that if you've got clients or taxpayers who do have dividends such as that, you can populate that through. Now we'll just go into item 13, partnerships and trusts. Uh, one thing always to remember, we noted in the managed fund that there was some income coming through. 
and we can see that's come through from Westfield Group. Now what is important to note is that you must fill in the second box uh, and let's just say that it's an other amount of $1,000, otherwise this will not validate. So you need to make sure that you come back to item 13 if there has been a distribution received within a managed fund. So that's a lot of the income side of things. Now with rental, Mary does have some rental properties, but instead of doing it within the return, this has come from a shared rental schedule. Now again, if you've got taxpayers or you've got clients that own properties with multiple uh, owners, it's important to go in and set up a shared rental schedule because that will save some time allow for probably more details than the direct rental schedule in the return, but also allow you to look at some information that then populates across. And if you make a change to the rental property schedule, then it will also filter in to the relevant individual clients you have. This is her property in Smith Street in Fitzgerald in Tasmania. There's no private use on the property. The property hasn't been sold. Uh, the property cost was $500,000 when she first acquired that and it hasn't been refinanced, the property. We click on next and you'll see there that the rental income was $10,000. Not all the expenses have yet been included, but we did have to get a new tenant during the year and that cost us $350. We've got body corporate fees of 1000 we have some council rates of 1200 We have some insurance that we paid of $1,000. We've got a loan on this property and during the year we paid $16,000. Uh, and then we have some agent fees. We've got an agent managing the property. A little bit of repairs and maintenance during the year, uh, which is $1,800. And then we have some water rates of another six $600. So this property has generated a loss of $13,150. When you hit next, uh, you see there, there are three owners of this property. Jane and Michael Fisher each own 25%. Jane and Michael, let's say, uh, brother and uh, sister-in-law uh, of Mary. And the share of the loss to Mary is negative 6575. Hit next and hit next to come out of that. And when you come out and save that, okay, when we then go back, you'll see a message about updating the returns to have a share of that property. We hit yes, and it gives us a note that we don't have a tax return for all of them, so they can't all be updated as yet. We haven't done uh, some of the Fisher returns yet. But with Mary, when we now go in to her return, uh, you'll see that we need to come out uh, of her return. So we'll jump out of there and we'll come back into her return. And as uh, part of the review now, going back to income, you'll see now with rent, negative 6575. So that property has come through and that 50% share has come through. So again, for anyone with clients who have rental properties that have multiple owners, it's a great idea to use the shared rental schedule. You just set it up just like any other tax schedule. You click on new and you go down and find shared rental and you just hit OK to create that particular schedule. Last couple of things just to quickly show you relate to some of the deductions and we mentioned the change uh, that came through with car expenses. Now Mary does have a car which she used for work. Now, if you go by the basic schedule, because it's just cents per kilometre, you can do this. But when you hit next, it allows you to create the worksheet for the car. So let's just say that she has a Nissan Patrol that she uses for work. Uh, the registration is ABC123. And it is a Nissan and it is a Patrol. Now, the original cost of that car, let's say, was $55,000. And we can choose logbook or set rate. Now, we're going to choose a logbook because she has a logbook. She bought the car, let's just say, on the 1st of July, 2015. 
The odometer start was a second hand car, so it was 27,500. And at the end of the year, she'd done up to 48,300 kilometres. And she's got a logbook percentage that shows a business percentage of 70%. And so she wants to claim that. She spent $3,000 on fuel. She didn't spend anything on tyres or a battery. She spent $1,200 on repairs, $800 on insurance, and $700 on her third party registration. So as part of that, we've got $5,700. We also click on worksheet because it has now set up a depreciation worksheet. We're going to use diminishing value and we're going to use 25%. And you'll see there that uh, it has done a calculation for us. 70% uh, and the full amount uh, to be transferred is 13788 but because it's 70%, you'll see that it calculates it through as the total, and then the total expense claim is 13,642. So you'll see there that once we put in the details, there is a figure there for set rate, but clearly the logbook gives us a better deduction. You can add some notes here. Uh, Mary's logbook was drafted in 2016. So you know that by 2021, or if the use of the car changes, she needs to do a new logbook. So we hit next, and that has populated through the uh, deduction for her car. So when we now go to the tax estimate, <coughs> you'll see there that there's a few things that come through. We noted up front that Mary had a help debt, so she's going to basically pay back the entire amount, given her earnings are so high. She has a TSL loan which when you go into it, goes in here, the trade support loan of 30000 because before she became an accountant, she was a, an apprentice mechanic, and so she borrowed some money there. Uh, so that will partially be repaid during the year. Uh, she, she doesn't have private health, so there's a Medicare levy surcharge, and she's also got the budget repair levy. So we made a high income here just so we could show you all of the various taxes coming through. And you can see there that the average rate of tax for Mary is about 40% uh, with all the other bits and pieces. So she's paying a, a very high tax percentage. So that's just some of the key elements of the individual returns in 2016. So you'll find that when you start to process, if you haven't yet started, uh, there's not a great deal of huge change in the returns, but a couple of really important changes, especially around motor vehicle deductions. The last couple of things we're going to just quickly show you today is a little bit of information for those that were interested in Reckon Elite Hosted. Now, there are two different versions of hosted, and, and really what this means is that you'll take your practice management software and be able to put it up in a hosted environment, which means by logging into a portal, you can then go in and access your database when and wherever you are, provided you've got an internet connection. There are two different versions. You can take the tax package, which will just give you practice management and the Reckon Elite tax module or the full package which will give you a private cloud environment. The full Reckon Elite software, so including Ledger, including Time Cost and Timesheet, and Microsoft Office, so you've got access to your Office tools in a hosted environment. When you do decide, or if you do decide to go down that track, you'll log in through some form of gateway. And this is just an example of the Citrix Netscaler Gateway. You log in with your username and password, and then you'll come up with a screen that looks like this if you've got the full version. You've got Excel, PowerPoint, Publisher, uh, Reckon Elite Practice Management and Word, so the Microsoft Office Suite. Now, for anybody who does have interest in this, uh, please feel free to get in touch with Elite. Uh, Matthew Bambrick, who's one of the business development managers, he can assist you with this, uh, give you all the pricing and details for it, uh, and show you how it all works. So again, we've had some people ask about it, so that's just something there for you. The final point of today's session is to look at some of the compliance updates, and note that what we need to think about in 2016-17, well at the moment, portal services are to be continued. 
You can still use ELS lodgements. You don't have to move everything to SBR yet. I think the OTO is a little bit behind on their project, so you will be able to continue with what you're currently doing. But one thing the OTO has made very clear is they want to enhance services to individuals and businesses. So a lot more electronic correspondence through MyGov, which can be frustrating as a tax agent when you don't get access to all of your clients' information. But they want to allow you to access uh, the individual and entity details eventually in your portal, in your practices but they're trying to encourage individuals to spend more time understanding their own tax affairs, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, certainly some agents think it's a bad thing and some clients think it's a bad thing because they pay an accountant to look after their affairs. More visibility of clients' tax affairs, but certainly more data matching with government agencies. Beyond 2017, we're going to see more development of SBR but will the ATO be ready to cope with all of these changes? And you'll also find that practice management software does link to other government agencies. Remember, we're past 30 June now, so your clients do need to be registered for SuperStream, especially where they're employing others outside of family members. And the final thing to mention today is with software compliance, Remember that you do need to have practice management software that is SBR enabled uh, and does simplify and reduce the time and costs associated with collating information and submitting reports with to government. So note that for anyone not aware that Reckon is an approved SBR software provider and also note that some of the minor forms that are currently in Reckon Elite may not continue under the full SBR regime. So final points to note is that you can start to use obviously SBR compliance issues. Reckon has been SBR compliant on certain forms since 2011-12 and also been working close, closely with the ATO both one-on-one -on -one and as part of consultative forums in respect of getting the SBR process moving forward. What it means for you as a user, not a great deal, very little change to the process currently being done. Uh, yes, as we mentioned, some forms might be different, uh, but again, you might have an ELS identifier which will become an OzKey credential. You're going to have the option up front, and again, as part of the approach, there are some drop downs that you can use in respect of SBR. Again, if you have further questions on this, please feel free to get in touch with Reckon Elite and they can provide some more direct guidance to you. What can you do now to prepare? Number one is make sure you're ready for the changes. Uh, if you are an existing user, you'll invested, you'll, you have invested in software with SBR. If you're a potential Reckon Elite user, you know that you can move forward with SBR compliant software. But identify any changes that might be required in your firm to plan for the future. So that officially completes the formal side of things. Uh, we mentioned that if you do have any direct questions that we don't have time for, to email training at reckon.com. But I'll throw back to Victoria now. Uh, are there any questions or queries that have been asked during today's session? Hi, David. Um, there's just one question. How do you use the ATO correspondent preferences? Okay, is that in relation to the reporting side of things or in respect of downloading information from the portal? Uh, because there's a, a number of things, and, and just to sort of take you very quickly through there, through the ATO processing side of things, uh, obviously, and you can see there, we just spoke about SBR, there's a little button there for SBR communication when you're ready for that. Um, in terms of ATO details, um, you've got a little button here for entry of tax assessments. 
So you, this is where you can manually enter some details if you want to. Uh, you can create returns from reports. So one thing that you can do if you're familiar with the portal, uh, you can go in and create some reports uh, from the portal. And again, if you're not certain of any of this, so uh, for the, the person that asked that particular question, click on the help screen and there are step-by-step -step instructions for you to follow. So this is a task that allows you to create jobs from ELS reports received from the ATO. So it actually tells you how to do it and you can go through step by step and it works you through the wizard on the screen. Um, so you can print these out as well. If you need any instructions, you can print these out and they will help you with uh, the ability to use I just got um, further clarification, sorry David. Um, yep. Joe said, under the client navigation screen, business tax details, there is a chart. Okay, right, I know what you mean. Okay, so when you go into uh, this little thing here, looking at, at the uh, the corner of the screen, uh, this little chart here, ATO Correspondence Preferences. Uh, let's just say most people don't use that at all. Uh, what that is, is if you've got a client that has activity statements or business statement accounts, this is basically looking at codes. Uh, most people, as I said, do not use this. Uh, but if you've got clients that are registered for GST and have particular preferences, um, that's basically what that's for. To be honest, I don't think it's a function that many users do use uh, in terms of that, uh, but it is there just if you want to, particularly for business taxpayers, probably more relevant than an individual. Um, it talks about correspondence preferences, but over time as the ATO is issuing things directly to clients, um, this is becoming less and less relevant as well. Okay, thanks David, that's the end of the questions. Do you want to wrap up with anything? Yeah, look, I was going to say, if there are any direct questions or if you do have anything that you want to discuss with Reckon in a sense of the hosted version or new features or functionality, uh, feel free to send an email to training at reckon.com and that'll be passed on to the relevant uh, person at Elite uh, who can help you with your query or if it's a training issue, again, they can assist you in that respect as well. So that's basically just to finish that off and uh, I guess we can wrap things up. Thanks, David. Thank you for the presentation today. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. We'll see you in the next webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye.